created, whether it's on YouTube, whether you have a plaque on your wall. Uh, I've even seen carpet that has it printed in there. Uh, the Lord's Prayer is pretty much everywhere and anywhere. Anything that somebody can put it on, whether it be a cup or a mug, it's on there, right? Everybody seems to know what the Lord's Prayer is. But the question is, is it something that we're just supposed to recite over and over again? Or is there a deeper meaning to it? Is it there's something that Jesus was saying that we need to understand? And we're going to get into that eventually, but today I want to really focus on the teachings that surround the Lord's Prayer. You see, for us, I hope we answer that question. It's very rational to answer, ask the question, how do we pray? Right? How do we pray? It's, as a Christian, that should be one of the first questions that comes up. How do we pray? And it's one of the first questions the disciples had, and they actually went to Jesus. And why? Because they saw him praying. Okay? They saw him taking time away from them, going off on his own and praying. And when somebody sees somebody else doing something, you always kind of have that question in your mind, why are you doing that? Okay? And so the disciples learned why he was doing that, but now they wanted to know how they could do it themselves because they wanted to be a part of it. And in two places in the, in the book of uh, Luke, also in the book of uh, Matthew, so in Luke 11, 2 to 13, and also Matthew 6, 5 to 18, on the screen I actually broke it down so that you could see which was from Luke and which was from Matthew. But we're going to put this on you to figure out where it's from. And you tell me if you can figure out where the different breaks are. Because what has happened here is Matthew and Luke both recorded Jesus saying the Lord's Prayer. And some people uh, outside of the faith look at that and say, well, there's, there's two differences in these stories. How can it be right? And, and my answer to that is, if there wasn't differences... I would be concerned. Because when you look at what the scriptures are, the, these letters are people who saw the events and then recorded them down. So Matthew saw Jesus doing this, and he recorded it down in the book of Matthew. Okay? Now Luke, we're told at the beginning of Luke, that Luke actually combined his letter as he investigated the stories. So Luke had a whole bunch of written documents, so written stories have said, this is the way it happened. Luke went through them. Uh, he, it talks about him doing it, like diligently searching out the, these stories. And then he compiled it all together. And then he wrote a letter to Theophilus. And that's what we have is the book of Luke. Okay, It's Luke combining all the stories of all these different eyewitnesses uh, and then putting it together in one letter. So when we look at what Matthew have and what Luke have, uh, there are some differences, even in the Lord's Prayer. Uh, if you've ever taken the time to read the two side by side, uh, Matthew includes some things that Luke doesn't. And vice versely, uh, Luke involves a lot of Jesus' teaching around the Lord's Prayer that Matthew doesn't. So by combining them together, we're going to get a bigger picture of what actually happened at that time when Jesus was teaching them and asking, or when they asked the question, Jesus, how do we pray? This was his response. So listen on. One day he was praying in a certain place, and when he finished, one of his disciples said, Master, teach us to pray, just as John taught his disciples. So Jesus said, And when you come before God, don't turn that into a theatrical production either. All of these people making a regular show out of their prayers, hoping for stardom. Do you think God sits in a box seat? Here's what I want you to do. Find a quiet, secluded place so that you won't be tempted to role play before God. Just be there simply and honestly as you can. With focus, shift from you to God, and you will begin to sense his grace. The world is full of so-called prayer warriors who are prayer ignorant. They're full of formulas and programs and advice, peddling techniques for getting what you want from God. Don't fall for that nonsense. This is your father you are dealing with, and he knows better than you than what you need. With a God like this loving you, you can pray very simply like this. Our Father in heaven, reveal who you are. Set the world right. Do what's best as above, so below. Keep us alive with three square meals. Keep us forgiven with you and forgiving others. Keep us safe from ourselves and the devil. You're in charge. You can do anything you want. You're ablaze in beauty. Yes, yes, yes. 
Then he said, imagine what would happen if you went to a friend in the middle of the night and said, friend, lend me three loaves of bread. An old friend traveling through just showed up and I don't have anything on hand. The friend answered from his bed, don't bother me. The, lo- the door is locked. My children are all down for the night. I can't get up and give you anything. But let me tell you, even if he won't get up because he's a friend, if you stand to your ground knocking and waking all the neighbors, he'll finally get up and get you whatever you need. Here's what I'm saying. Ask and you get. Seek and you'll find. Knock and the door will be open. Don't bargain with God. Be direct. Ask for what you need. This is not a cat and mouse hide and seek game we're in. If your little boy asks for a serving of fish, do you scare him with a live snake on his plate? Or if your little girl asks for an egg, do you trick her with a spider? As bad as you are, you wouldn't think of such a thing. You're at least decent to your own children. And don't you think the Father who conceived you in love will give you the Holy Spirit when you ask him? In prayer, there is a connection between what God does and what you do. You can't get forgiveness from God, for instance, without also forgiving others. If you refuse to do your part, you cut yourself off from God's part. Let's pray. Lord, Heavenly Father, we thank you that you did teach us how to pray. Lord, that we can learn from your teachings, and God, we can develop intimacy with you through our prayers. So, Lord, help us, guide us, and God, let us hear what you're saying today, we ask in your name. Amen. So, how many of you ever heard that in that way? A little different. It's a message. Good picking out. Uh, that's why I'm encouraged to read these different versions, because the message presents things in a way that makes you think, wow, does that really say that? And it does. Uh, it's just put in our modern vernacular in the way that we talk today so that you can understand it a little better. But in combining these two passages, you really get a sense of what Jesus was teaching about prayer. Okay, uh, The Lord's Prayer was not something that was just, okay, when you pray, say these words. Okay, That's not what it is. Rather, he was giving a model. He was giving a model of how to pray. And not only that model is... It's very simple to put up that you, you praise God, okay? Uh, you, you ask God. Now, the Sunday school is learning a little acronym, pray. Anybody want to stand up and say it? Come on, you teachers. Pray. Praise. There you go. Now, I gave my wife a hard time about this. I'm like, where's listen? Come on, where is, I know it's tucking to the yield. That's where they put it. To yield to God means to listen to God. But listening is the most important part of prayer. We have to remember that. So now we've got to think of a word, pray, that has L in it. Okay. If anybody can come up with that, we'll have the greatest acronym ever. Uh, but that, it's a technique uh, for learning how to organize your prayers. Okay? You start and you end with praise. Okay, you, you praise God. And, and I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this today. I'm going to move on and we're going to spend time on the other teachings that Jesus put surrounding this whole uh, aspect of the Lord's Prayer. And, and in this, I want to look at the highlights from Jesus' teaching on prayer. Now, these aren't all of them. These are just kind of the ones that stuck out to me. The first thing I want to talk about is that prayer is not a theatrical production. We get that out of Matthew chapter 6, verse 5. You see, when you pray, you don't pray to impress people. You know, we've all been there uh, where you hear someone pray and you're just like, wow, that person knows how to pray, right? And what does that make you feel like? I don't know how to pray, so I'm not going to pray, right? And, and that is just the wrong, wrong thinking, okay? Prayer is not some big theatrical production. It's not done to say, this is how great I am. Uh, you can quote me on this one. Your vocabulary is not indicative of your spiritual maturity. Okay? Get that down. Your vocabulary is not indicative of your spiritual maturity. Just because you can pray great doesn't mean you know how to pray. Okay? There's a difference there. When you come to God, when you, you talk to him, number two is find a quiet, secluded place. Matthew 6, verse 6. You see, God's interested in your heart. He doesn't want some big, blowing up uh, extravaganza. He doesn't need you to yell. He can hear you just fine. Uh, but 
he tells us to go find a quiet, secluded place. Why is that? Because the biggest part of prayer, as I said before, and I will continue to say, is listening to God. When you are not in a quiet, secluded place, it is very easy to be distracted and not hear what God is saying. Okay, So that's why Jesus says, go find a quiet, secluded place. Lock yourself in your, in your closet, whatever you need to do uh, so that you can hear. Because all of us can talk when other people are talking. right? When there's distractions going on, it's easy to talk. However, it is very, very difficult to listen when there are distractions going on. So point two, God's interest in your heart. So find a quiet, secluded place. He wants to hear the real you, not just the person you're pretending to be. You see, part of this is, is when we are, when we're praying in public, we're always aware of what other people are there thinking and we pray to impress. And Jesus says, don't do that. Okay, don't pray to impress. You're, you're praying to talk to God. You're, you're, you're praying so that he can hear you and you can hear him. So you don't got to put up some fancy facade. You don't have to use big fancy words so that God will be impressed. Okay. I, I love that way that they reference that. God's not sitting in a, in a bench seat. Like it, it's given the analogy here, uh, that you're in a stadium. Okay. And you have box seats and it's saying, okay, God's not sitting in the box seat listening to your production. Okay. That's not the way it is. Rather, it's when we get alone and we commune, we just settle down with God and you be real with him. Okay. You don't got to dress things up. You don't have to make a big long story out of it. And it's kind of funny that we'd ever think that would work with God because he already knows everything about us. Right. So you don't got to dress it up. You just, you're real when you talk with God. If you're angry, he knows you're angry. You can be angry. If you're hurt, he knows you're hurt. If you're sad, he knows you're sad. Okay, You don't have to hide it. You don't have to cover it up. Uh, there is a portion of that where David talks to his own soul, telling him to lift up his countenance, right? So he's telling himself to, to get excited about what God is doing. And, and there's an aspect of prayer that we need to do with that. But point number three is don't babble on and on. We don't do that, do we? Do we? Well, reading this in the New Living Translation in Matthew 6, 7, and 8 says, When you pray, don't babble on and on as people of other religions do. They think their prayers will be answered merely by repeating their words again and again. Don't be like them. Your Father knows exactly what you need even before you ask Him. And then reading out of the NSB, the same passage, it says, And when you are praying, do not use meaningless repetition as the Gentiles do. For they suppose that they will be heard for their many words. So don't be like them, for your Father knows what you need before you ask Him. We don't need to babble on and on with God, okay? We don't need to keep saying it over and over and over again because maybe He didn't get it the first time. Maybe He's not listening, or maybe if we ask it enough, then He will answer. That is so far off base, I can't tell you how wrong it is. Uh, and that's what Jesus gets into. And now I know what many of you say. It says, but Luke 5, 8 says, if your neighbor comes to you and pounds on your door and says, give me those loaves because I had some visitors come and I have nothing to feed them. And if you just keep pounding on that door, eventually that neighbor will give you it just because you're annoying him and he will give it to you. Now we take that and says, okay, if we annoy God enough, he will give us what we want. How many have thought that? Don't put up your hand. But we think that's what the, that passage is teaching. Okay, That's not what that passage is teaching. That's nothing to do with that passage. What Jesus is saying here, when you read it all in the context of what he was saying using Matthew and Luke put together, he's not the neighbor. Okay, God is not the neighbor in this situation. He's not the one saying, if you keep knocking and knocking, eventually I'll answer you. No. He's saying, even someone as, as idiotic as your neighbor will cave into it. But I'm not like that. Okay? He talks about, he, he's a good father. Like, you wouldn't give your son a, a snake, or you wouldn't give your daughter a spider. Why would you think I would do that? 
Because I'm even greater than you are. I'm even more loving than you are. I'm even more patient. I'm more considerate. I'm more of this than you ever will be. So why do we think that if we just keep over and over, eventually he has to listen? What that is, is that gives us a totally wrong representation of who God is. We start to think that God's somebody that we have to convince to do good things for us. Have you ever felt you have to convince God to do something good for you? Okay, you can put up your hand for that, because we'd all be putting up our hand there. But the truth is, you do not have to convince God to do anything good for you. He's already wanting to do it. So you're wasting your time trying to convince him, because he wants to do the good things. See, God's not the sleeping neighbor. He's better than that. Rather, he said, ask and you'll get. Seek and you'll find. Knock and and the door will be open. You see, when I, I break this down and I look at it, I think as Christians, we're really good with the asking part. We know how to ask God for what we want. I think where we fall short is on the seeking and the knocking. You see, prayer is not only asking God for the answer, it's seeking him to find it. Okay, so when you pray to God, God, we ask him, God, show me this, and then we move on. And that's totally the wrong method of prayer. Jesus tells us to ask and then seek. So when, once we ask the question, we need to seek for the answer. How do we seek for the answer? Listening. Listening is how you seek for the answer. You see, I think so many of our prayers are caught up in that we keep asking and asking and asking, and then we never listen for what the answer is. And that's why we get frustrated. That's why we get caught up, is because we're always asking, 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 but we're never listening. We're never listening. We don't listen. Because once you listen, the next part, I love this, ask, seek, and, and, and knock, What's the knock portion meaning? It's putting it to action. You see, once you ask the question, you seek out the answer, then you got to do what God's told you to do. Okay? That's the three components. Ask, seek, knock. So the first thing you do is you ask. Then you listen for the answer. And then you do what God's told you to do. If we put that model down, if we understand that is part of our prayer lives, you won't have any more unanswered prayers. Why? Because there's three answers to your prayers. God can say yes, God can say no, and God can say wait. The wait is a hard one. We don't like the no either, but wait is hardest. And when we look at that, when we ask God, God, Please let this happen. He will say either, yes, I will do that. And this is what you need to do to get it done. And then you do it. Or he will say, no, that is not in my will. Move on. Or he might just say, wait, it's not the right time yet. We have a great example. because You ask the question, maybe you don't, but I do. How many times can we pray about something? Like if God doesn't answer the first time, it's usually because we're not listening. So we pray again. And then we're not listening, so we pray again. And we're not listening. But even if we're listening, understand this. That there are, there are different reasons. So Paul says this in the book of 2 Corinthians chapter 12. Paul says he asked God three times to remove his thorn in the flesh. And each time Jesus responded, My grace is all you need. My power works best in your weakness. So even the Apostle Paul spoke and asked God three times. And he even gave him the answer three times. Okay, It's not that Paul asked three times and God answered him on the third time. It's each time Paul prayed, God answered him and said the same thing three times over and over again. My grace is all you need. My power works best in your weakness. You see, when we're praying, if we really have an honest an open heart, we're not praying that my will is done. We're praying 
that thy will be done. Okay? We want God's will to be done in our lives. So that means when we ask the question, we wait for his answer. Okay? We, we wait for him to come down and say, yes, this is what I want you to do. Uh, and this is, this is so revolutionary, people. We need to get a handle on this. That our prayers are a time where we ask God and then we seek him for the answer by waiting, by listening, and then we do what he's asked us to do. Number four, don't fall for formulas and programs and advice, peddling techniques for getting what you want from God. Anybody ever bargain with God? Oh, you guys are all a bunch of saints, aren't you? Come on. God, if you do that, I'll do this. God, if you do this, I'll do that. Nobody's ever said that before? Good. You haven't done it, that means you won't ever do it again. But don't do it. Okay? Because again, all that does is reinforce that you have to convince God of what you want. Okay? And that's not where we're sitting here. God is somebody who will give you everything you need, everything that is good. He will supply. So we don't have to convince Him. We don't have to bargain with Him. Okay? God wants to give you good gifts. And finally, number six, there's a connection between what God does and what you do. Prayer should lead to action. When you say amen, you should have an idea of what you're to do next. Okay? It's not close off the prayer, God, amen, move on. No, it's amen is, what are you saying? What does amen mean? Let it be so. Okay? Yeah, let it be so, let it happen. What are you saying? God, let my prayers happen? No. It's God, let your will happen. God, what you want happen, let it, let it occur. So you have to take the time to hear what God's will is before you can say amen. You get that? You have to listen to what God wants you to do before you say amen. Because God is going to tell you to do something. And your amen is the answer. Say, yes, God, I'm going to go do that. Remember that. When you say amen, you are agreeing with God that that's what you're going to do. So you have to listen. You got to hear, God, this is, this is my problem. I'm going through this. God will tell you, okay, then I want you to do this. And then you say, okay, God, I will do that. I agree with that. I will do it. And that is the model of prayer. Okay? That's, it's basic. It's simple. That's why when Jesus talks about here, don't fall for formulas or any of these great things or expectations because prayer is simple. Okay? We blow it way out of proportion. We make it a lot larger than it is. And if we just under the, understand the simple aspect of, of seek and knock, what was the first one? Ask. Good. We're good with that one, right? We know how to ask. But we want to ask. We want to seek out the answer. And then we want to do what God is telling us to do. So just to close, look forward to your prayer time. Okay? Look forward to it. Your, your attitude, it's not a have to. It's a get to. And by allowing God to hearing what he says is going to change your life considerably. If we hear what he says and we agree that we're going to do that, we're going to see mir miraculous things happen. You're going to see life-altering events take place. Because God wants to work through you. You are his hands. You are his feet. Okay? And instead of just sitting there and asking God to do things, we need to listen to what he wants us to do in those situations and then go out and do it. He wants to give you supernatural insights and wisdom. Okay? God wants to reveal things to you that humanly you do not know, nor can you learn. He wants to reveal supernatural insights and wisdom so that you have the answer to every situation you have come across. You have the answer uh, to every problem you may face. And he will guide you all your days. He's promised that. He's promised to guide you. He's promised to direct you. And... and 
The whole word Lord, have you ever thought of that? What the word Lord means? When we call him the Lord of our life, what does that mean? It means he's the one who makes the decisions. Lord is the one who is in control. He's the one who tells people what to do. So if Jesus is the Lord of your life, he's the one who's making decisions in your life. The problem is, we don't listen to those decisions. We just keep doing what we want to do. And, oh yeah, God, you're the Lord of my life. La, la, la. But I'm going to do this, this, and this. Oh God, you're the Lord of my life. Oh, why isn't things working the way they should? Why are things falling apart? Why are this? Well, God says, hey, Listen to my direction. Listen to my voice. Listen to what I want you to do. And if you obey it, you will have success. You will have everything you desire because I will give you everything that is good. Let's pray. Our dear Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, that we can come to you because you are such a great and awesome God. You are so marvelous in all your ways. And Lord, you're so patient. God, you are, you are so patient with us. And Lord, we want to be people who hear your voice and not only hear it, but we respond to it. We want to be people who, God, we're willing to do whatever you ask us to do. So Lord, I pray that you would give us direction, you would give us wisdom. And Lord, when we hear your voice, we would respond to it in faith. In Jesus' name, amen.